Okay, as General Ham said, I'm uh, Brigadier General J.P. McGee, the Deputy Commanding General for Operations for Army Cyber Command. As General Ham alluded, I do not come from a cyber background. I'm a career infantry officer. As most of my friends who meet me and see me in this job, they say, what the hell do you know about cyber? And my answer is about four months more than you do. <laughs> So what we'd like to do today is talk about what is happening. It's a great example of Army innovation and adaptation and experimentation in order to develop a cyber effect at the, uh, at the tactical edge. And it, what we have here is, is a whole bunch of different players who are involved in the cyber enterprise and affecting this great change within, uh, within our Army. So what I'd like to do is briefly introduce each of them, and as we sort of work through from the General Frost, who's HQDA at, uh, at Demo Cyber, we've got Ken Rector who is in charge of the Cyber School and the Cyber Center of Excellence. We've got Steve Oatman, who's the G39 at Forcecom, working for, uh, for SEMA effects within Forcecom. And then we've got Jerry Turner, who actually did one of the, you know, one of the pilot rotations. Um, I'll introduce them briefly and then talk about their p perspective on the Cyber Support to Core and Below CSCB uh, initiative, as we've talked about it, and then uh, we'll start delving into some more questions. So first off, with some framing comments is going to be Brigadier General Promotable Patricia Frost, who is a career military intelligence officer, previously had my job as the Deputy Commanding General for Operations at Army Cyber Command, and is now working in a new directorate within the Army staff, which is known as the, uh, the Cyber Directorate within the HQ Headquarters Department of the Army, G357. So over to General Frost for some initial comments, please. Okay, so good morning, late morning. Uh, it's great to be here today. So I just want to frame, many of you know the journey that we've been on for cyber support to Corum Below. And many of you here in the audience actually have supported us in one way. Um, so I just want to just level it so everyone knows where we've been and, and where we think we should go in this area. And we really welcome any suggestions and recommendations as we move forward. So we were doing quarterly Chief of Staff of the Army updates back when General Nakasone was the DCG, G3 and DCG. And we had great momentum in the cyber mission force build. So probably discussed earlier the 100 plus teams by US Cyber Command and the Army's portion of 40 plus teams to be part of that cyber mission force. That had a great traje trajectory, uh, very uh, joint standards for training and the work roles that we would build of that force. Uh, during one of the CSA updates back in May of 2014, General Odierno turned to then General Cardone, the commanding general of Army Cyber and Second Army, and posed the question, well, what about the rest of the Army? Meaning, what are we going to do for unified land operations, and really, how are we going to equip and bring capabilities to core and below formations? recognizing that the cyber mission force and its build and the missions that were being discussed that would be aligned to those teams was at a very strategic defend the nation or combatant command priorities. And then what would be framed in the requirements that you might have for a core division or a brigade commander within their battle space. Very interesting question, knowing that we didn't have any force structure dedicated to really solve that problem. So he, he actually tasked us with getting out to the combat training centers um, by September. This was May. He told us by September of 14, he wanted us in the CTCs full up, training side by side with uh, units. So we got a little bit of a reprieve because we had to really think about um, what was in the realm of the possible. And the first hurdle we had to overcome is the infrastructure that exists at the combat training centers really don't give you the environment that you need um, to actually replicate, replicate the cyberspace operational environment. So we went into that first rotation um, at JRTC at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and that, that was a, a very nascent um, rotation. And uh, we'll get in a little bit later about the formations that we had at each of those. But what we recognize as we, we lay this out for then General Odierno is we recognize there were truly three lines of effort that we needed to pursue if we were going to have this discussion of how would you bring capabilities to core and below units is we had to focus on combat training centers. So that was one line of effort. We had to look at what support did we need to bring um, out at Fort Bliss for our Army warfighting um, experiments. We didn't want to be part of the test and evaluation st stage per se, but we wanted to be part of that warfighting um, experiment. 
And then we also were looking at theater level exercises such as Operation Atlantic Resolve or Pacific Pathways to really think about defensively um, what, what is required within these different formations at Echelon um, to be able to operate and have, uh, have freedom of maneuver in the cyberspace domain. So, uh, so we, we looked at the learn by doing model. So we didn't want to go through a long, and no offense to any of my trade offs brothers here, the trade ocean model of admire a problem. So we thought we would just jump right in. And so we decided to put together, uh, we, it was a headquarters DA XOR that brought together Department of the Army leadership, uh, Forcecom, TRADOC, and we also had help, I see Army Cyber Institute here as well, and uh, some of the expertise that they bring to look at how would we move down these different lines of effort um, in the future. So that was truly, and it has been, a great marriage of all these organizations to try to define this. And I believe as we go forward, and I'm gonna then turn it right now back over to, to General McGee, is we owe every commander at Echelon at Quorum Below the ability to visualize not only the cyber domain, but actually understand how they are seen in the electromagnetic spectrum writ large. So we talk about the cyber domain, but I will tell you how are we gonna visualize for the commanders as they're, as they're going to maneuver, how are they seen in the EMS, the electromagnetic spectrum, and how can they see the enemy? So we'll talk about how this is going to evolve over time. So with that, I'll turn it back over to JP. Great, uh, thank you very much, General Frost. Okay, next over to, uh, to Colonel Ken Rector. Colonel Ken Rector is a career military intelligence officer who's commanded at the battalion and brigade level and has recently transitioned to become a cyber officer. He is presently serving as the commandant of the United States Army Cyber School at Fort Gordon, Georgia, after having previously served as a chief of staff for Army Cyber Command. So he brings a great perspective in terms of the institutional piece of it as the uh, cyber school, but also the operational uh, piece coming from Army Cyber Command. So, Ken, I'll turn it over to you for a couple opening comments. All right, sir, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the opportunity to uh, represent the Cyber Center of Ex Excellence and Major General John Morrison, the commander down there. I will bring to you a little bit of the institutional aspect of it. I would, I would first state that uh, as an Army, we should be very proud of what the Army has invested into cyber and cyber operations, the, the level of importance and uh, attention that it receives from senior, senior leaders does not go unnoticed. I will tell you the Army and TRADOC and the Cyber Operational Force has invested in, into a lot into the institution, uh, the cyber school in particular, to make sure we are successful. And it is definitely a work in progress, but uh, we should be very proud to be the only service to date that has made a cyber branch. And that's, that's in large part to the importance they place on this. Uh, right now we're working through many things. I'll just give you a brief aspect of the institutional part of it. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, people are the foundation of cyber operations. You know, we talk about, uh, there's a re recent article that's been published about the cyber truths, the cyber truths, and uh, humans are, are more important than hardware. And I, I say that because in a cyber officer's career, if he or she serves, you know, 10, 20, or 30 years, it's very likely that technology will turn several times in their, in their career. And so that goes a long way in how we are trying to approach uh, tr training cyber operators inside of the school, uh, because it's not about uh, teaching uh, buttonology, it's not about teaching uh, uh, sets of kits and outfits, but it's about teaching theory and understanding that you have to embrace the technology and understand the theory about what we're teaching so you can be a practical application, because that technology you're existing, that exists today is very likely has a shelf life. You know, it would expire, and then we have to have the, the smart cyber operators to develop the new technology to be uh, more appropriate for the future technologies from the adversaries or just the overall network. Um, our job right, down at the, right now at the cyber school is to produce uh, highly trained uh, cyber operators. And, and foundationally speaking, we want them to be resilient, adaptive, be, fr be comfortable in working in uh, ambiguous environments be a team player. And maybe the most important aspect of it, what we're trying to teach the, the operators, is they have to be invested in lifelong learning. And in, in particular, the, the, the part of the life that they're in, we learn in the uh, uniform, or they become Department of Army Civilians or a contract. If they're in the cyber workforce, they have to be embraced the lifelong uh, learning aspect of it. Uh, we do that because I would tell you if, you, if you have an opportunity to come to the cyber school, it is not your typical trade 
uh, cyber in classroom environment. Uh, because of the, uh, the uniqueness of cyber, they are small classes. Uh, the classes, uh, you know, we're just now, you know, it's, it's a growth industry, if you will. FY16, we produced the first BOLEC class, as General Nakasone mentioned. We have a BOLEC class in session as we speak. And next year we'll produce, uh, we'll have 26 separate classes that will graduate through the cyber school in FY17. FY16, we produced 131 cyber operators. Uh, FY17, we are forecasted to produce 561 cyber operators, both in active component and COMPO2 and COMPO3. Uh, the uniqueness is uh, the, the POI is, uh, it changes. And I submit to you that what a, uh, an NCO receives in training in January of 17 will probably be much different uh, in orders of magnitude different in June of 17 because we have the ability to, to change the POI based off, based off of expertise and evolving technology. The other unique uh, aspect of the classroom environment is um, some of the SMEs are actually the students within the classroom. Uh, we have, uh, the Army made a decision that some of the officers have graduated from, they have assessed into the Army, and they went immediately uh, from graduating their commissioning, uh, commissioning to right into advanced civil schooling. So they, may, they might have an opportunity to come to with a master's degree in some kind of unique technology. Therefore, when they come to the classroom, they might be the expert about teaching SCADA. They might be the expert about the router that, that we're talking about. So I think that's unique to, uh, to cyber. Uh, that we, we uh, talk about the adaptive soldier and leader training and education methodology. We call it the adult learning model. That uh, we typically in the cyber classroom, uh, given that foundationally they are soldiers, and that's, that's the foundation we start with. And then we go into the technical aspects of uh, the training. Uh, we allow them to have an adaptive in environment, an environment that there's some crosstalk within the classroom. And maybe, as I mentioned, maybe the instructor isn't the expertise. But we don't have, you know, 85 PowerPoint slides followed by a 10-minute discussion and they have a multiple choice test or something like that. They talk about the theory of, of cyber, the theory of, of signals intelligence, the theory of, you know, wave propagation, things like that. We talked about electronic warfare. And then we expose that the, the students to different types of ways to assess their understanding of the knowledge we presented. So. Uh, once again, uh, in closing, and we can talk a little bit more about the cyber support decorum below and how we're training uh, students inside a cyber school, but uh, you know, the, we should be very proud as an Army about how we've invested into the institution and the product we are producing to support the cyber mission force. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Ken. Next, I'd like to introduce Colonel Steve Oatman, who's currently Chief of the U.S. Army Forces Command G39 Directorate, which is responsible for the integration of SEMA across all of, uh, you know, all of ForceCom. Steve is a uh, career artillery officer who, who transitioned over time to become an electronics warfare officer, and he has previously served as the director of the Army Electronic Warfare School, as well as served at the TRADOC capability, as the TRADOC capability manager for electronic warfare. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to be here and uh, for the invitation from uh, General Swan and General Ham to participate in, in the panel today. Uh, so at Forcecom, uh, I am the G39 responsible for the, uh, the integration of cyber electronic warfare, uh, IO space and special technical operations uh, for Forces Command as Forces Command attempts to uh, perform its mission, which is to provide a trained and ready forces to uh, the combatant commander. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, we have to man, equip, and then train those personnel. And until we get the manning and equipping correct, especially with our new emerging forces like the cyber and electronic warfare forces, uh, we have a tough time getting after that training piece uh, because without the right manning structure, without the right equipment, uh, it's hard for us to then train a soldier or a formation to then provide to somebody like Jerry Turner to employ on the battlefield to enable his scheme of maneuver uh, and dominate the spectrum at the time and place of his choosing uh, as we go forward. I think as we uh, get through the discussion today, uh, we'll see where that SEMA cell, the vision for that SEMA cell uh, is really intended to uh, cross cut across multiple warfighting uh, formations and functions to not be the lead, but to be the integrator for 
uh, all of those different uh, warfighting functions uh, and then be able to bring uh, that collaborative and uh, call it ingested fused information back to the commander so he can make a decision uh, whether it's understanding the EME as General Frost uh, talked about where it's critical that he's able to see himself but also be able to see the enemy uh, in real time uh, whether that's understanding uh, the intel side and, and the analytics that the IC is providing back uh, as we enter into the targeting process um, and or where at the time and place of his choosing he can move to more exquisite techniques uh, that can be delivered by the cyber uh, community uh, on top of a organic or a portioned uh, more operational EW capability set uh, that he's able to employ uh, more freely on the battlefield. Okay, thanks Steve, that's great. And uh, finally, I'd like to introduce Colonel Jerry Kerner. Turner, the Lancer 6, currently the commander of the 2nd Striker Brigade Combat Team in the 2nd Infantry Division. Jerry and his team participated in the fourth integration of the CSCB pilot out at the National Training Center. And uh, Jerry is a career CAV officer who provides some great perspectives on how this has been integrated at the tactical edge. So, Jerry, over to you. Again, to, to echo St Stephen Ken, thanks for inviting me. Um, I, I'm really excited about this and really excited about what we're doing. Uh, and really, I'll, j I'll just start with a, a, a couple of key points that I think we got over the last, I don't know, 15 months that I've been in command. You know, last summer when I took command of a striker brigade, I figured all I really had to do was worry about where my hand mic was and, and how I'd operate an FM radio. Uh, it's actually more complicated than that. Uh, and especially since I can no longer operate my FM radio, because that's too complicated. Uh, so, so we go on from there. So we got the opportunity last summer, we heard we're going to get to do the cyber pilot. And uh, as, as an organization, we were offered a lot of assist from, from General Frost and her team, the 70 80th, uh, to actually learn about how we would operate in a tactical environment with cyber folks. Uh, our BCT kind of took on the idea that, hey, this is, it's 1940s in Louisiana, and we don't have Shermans and Grants, but we got Jeeps and trucks, and we'll paint that on the side, and we'll figure out how to think through this problem. Uh, and we did a lot of train up through, you know, both live, constructive and virtual to be able to get after it. A great cyber week with some very good executive conversations on authorities and permissions and how those things were going to kind of work uh, from a brigade commander perspective. Um, and I'll tell you, I, 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 we, as, as fast and as great as I do think we're going, we got to get better. Uh, you know, this idea of, of, a, of a threat that outguns me, outmatches me in, in every conceivable way, at least that's what we're talking about, means my one advantage on the battlefield is, is mission command, both as a war fighting function and as a system. Uh, so I either need to attack the enemies or I got to protect mine uh, because I can't operate without it. Our force structure is designed to have that agility that's associated with, with our network systems. And, uh, and if we're back to pyrotechnics and signal flares, I need more infantrymen. Uh, and, and so I think we really have to continue to get after uh, th this cyber places, or this cyber pieces we go forward, so. Okay, thanks, Jerry. So for my, my line of question, at least to open this up, I'll try to start sort of big and then narrow it down to the tactical level where Jerry was operating. And then when we're done sort of dealing with the CSCB pilot, um, we'll start talking about how that helps, uh, helps inform the future. So starting at the higher level, so to General Frost, who was involved with, you know, all of these, can you please describe how the CSCB concept has innovated and evolved from its original sort of envisionment to what it's become today? So what we learned over time is that when you look at expeditionary, it started out as expeditionary cyber teams, we've evolved to expeditionary SEMA, cyber electromagnetic activity type teams. I've heard expeditionary, I think you have a new term at, at CyberCo, no? Okay, it's all good. Um, so, so whatever we're going to call it in the future is a lot of, um, there was a lot of discussion of would that be organic at a brigade combat team? And what we've uh, evolved over time is we're talking about you would create this team um, based on the operating environment. So we looked at holistically probably about 15 soldiers of various rank and expertise that provide a defensive cyber capability, an offensive cyber capability, electronic warfare and information operations, recognizing that unfortunately in, in force structure uh, cuts over time, we've actually lost the information operations officer at the BCT level. So we recognized that as we went forward in the pilot, that was something that we were gonna have to augment 
at the BCT level. And then as we went through this, this is actually a, a asset, a capability that's given to either a core or a division commander. So because that is really where the, the breadth and depth of your planning staff is. And so that is given to core and division and then based on where you're going to weight your effort and based on the operational environment that you would decide where that augmentation would be needed on the battlefield. So that's really what we want people to understand. It's not some 80 person, uh, 80 soldier element that's coming down. And in, in some cases it may only be the DCO or EW aspect or it may be DCO IO aspect. So that is what we're trying to put our arms around, recognizing, and for all of my electronic warfare uh, personnel in the room, we recognize that we lack today electronic warfare operators within our core and below formations. So this again, what we're looking at these pilots is to really help us shape the dot mil PF, the doctrine, the organization, the leadership, the training, all the aspects, the equipping of where we need to be in force 2025. What should that look like? If, we were, if we're saying this is important to the Army, that we want to ensure that these capabilities are provided to core and below formations. Just in the short time period that we've been doing these pilots over the last two years, we've actually changed the MTO in a very quick fashion already at core and below, providing defensive cyber warriors in those formations. So you now have a 255 Sierra and a 25 Delta that have been trained by the Center of Excellence to bring those defensive capabilities, given the right cyber tools, that they can now be active defenders within um, that formation. We recognize that was critical. A cyber protection team or expeditionary defensive uh, support team coming in means that it is a different type of threat that has gotten within your wire and you actually need some extra capability that needs to come on top of your formation because what you have organically is not enough to fight against that adversary within your network. So again, the, the purpose of the pilot was to look at how do you build that formation. So on the big end, about 15 soldiers that could cross all those different types of capabilities that then can work within the BCT, learn the systems and processes of that brigade commander, what are the effects that that brigade commander is trying to achieve, and, and figure out within phases of operation how they can be integrated and synchronized. Some of our soldiers walked away a little disappointed when the brigade commander didn't pick them for that effect, and they felt that they, as we know, did a lot of work, a lot of planning, presented the CONOP, but that CONOP was not the one chosen, but that the brigade commander gets a vote. Um, based on what is happening within the, bat within the battle. So what we recognize is that's kind of the formation that we've started with. It started out very, very nascent with just really focused on defense with a small offensive team. That was pretty much the first pilot. And over time, we've gradually built that. So I think we're pretty comfortable right now that that 15 soldier team is the most that would actually fall on top of a brigade commander. And those are operators. Um, the SEMA cell that already exists within the MTO of the brigade, they're the ones that understand all the, the battle rhythm, the systems and processes, the fires process of that brigade, because each brigade does it a little bit differently. Um, they're the ones that will take those, those capabilities, that, those teams, and integrate them into the brigade commander schema maneuver. So that is what we frame it with today as we go forward. In this last NTC rotation, we actually brought electronic warfare capabilities both for the OP4 and for the RTU, the rotational unit, the BCT in the box, to allow to try to define what would be needed for the type of operators and what needs to be also organic at core and below just on the electro war electronic warfare side. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, next, I'd like to transition and maybe frame this a little bit with the, with the challenges and sort of the opportunities that exist within actually building a cyber domain. So as we looked at what we were doing at NTC, and as I got my head around this issue, I, I'll give you a pretty simple analogy to help describe sort of the scope of the issue. When you try to build a cyber domain, because it's a man-made domain, it's a bit like asking the Navy to come and participate in an exercise with naval gunfire and asking the Navy to bring the ship, the crew, its weapon systems, and then bring the C as well, okay? Because it's got, you've got to create the domain, and the domain pre-existing out at NTC didn't replicate 
what the domain would be if we were called to fight in South Korea, Eastern Ukraine, Northern Iraq, or Syria. Any of these places have a pre-existing cyber domain that we need to be able to replicate in a contested and congested environment within our training centers. Some significant work has gone into that. Much more work needs to go into that. But to, to Colonel Oatman uh, at, at Forcecom, can you tell us how Forcecom is viewing the importance of creating this contested cyber domain and then the way forward when the Forcecom would do this at the training centers? Yes, sir. So first, just for everybody's uh, understanding, uh, if you're old, old Army like me, I enlisted in 88, uh, the CTCs used to uh, fall under TRADOC. <laughs> See, I don't think it's that old. <laughs> you, so the, the CTCs fell under TRADOC. Uh, a few years ago, they shifted, so now Forcecom has a purview for uh, the National Training Center, the Joint Readiness Training Center, uh, and then uh, UCOM has uh, uh, JMRC uh, in terms of setting the conditions for the forces that are going to be training at those, uh, those dirt combat training centers now. Um, and then MCTP still falls under, under TRADOC uh, to facilitate warfighter exercises, uh, division and core levels. Uh, so as we look to try and create uh, the contested environment that the chief has uh, alluded to and directed uh, the Army to consider and, and figure out how to fight and train it within, uh, we, we've had some uh, significant challenges uh, based on some of the things like, like General McGee said. Creating that network infrastructure is uh, incredibly complex. Uh, to try and create a signature uh, like we would expect a formation to see on a battlefield in, uh, you name it, whether it's a, a Southwest Asia type of uh, a coin environment, uh, or if we're in a, a European theater, uh, against uh, what we would consider a, uh, a peer, near peer adversary and the infrastructure uh, that surrounds both of those two different types of environments. But not only the networks, creating the network side of that so that we can do things that exercise our DCO and OCO teams and capabilities and allow the commanders uh, at those rotations to employ effects on their behalf or have to defend against effects that the OP4 are employing we also have to create the similar spectrum utilization that we would expect to see uh, RF-wise in the same uh, environments, whether that's Wi-Fi, YLAN, uh, cellular, uh, FM radio, uh, all the different uh, RF transmitting types, uh, satellite, uh, VSAT, you name it. Every single one of those signatures starts to create a very contested environment and cluttered environment that then becomes hard to to understand unless we have a way to start visualizing those tools to then start breaking out the target sets of what really becomes important to that commander. Uh, what can the adversary see based on a commander whose signature on the battlefield uh, is continually emitting right now? Uh, so does his adversary have the ability to detect him? And if so, how does he mitigate that when he doesn't have the ability to turn off a lot of those emitters at this point and go into a MCON type of uh, uh, environment uh, at a critical time before he wants to execute a, uh, uh, an attack or move into a defensive position or, or something else? So all of those pieces, uh, it is Forcecom, it is the, the CSA's intent, it, intent, it is General Abrams' intent, to be able to create and replicate those types of environments at both of the uh, CONUS CTCs, JRTC and NTC, understanding that we also have some constraints based on utilization of spectrum, uh, which is its own challenge. Um, but then not only create them at the CTCs, we have to figure out how do we do the same thing at home station so that our units can actually train against that threat uh, maybe not to as robust a uh, level as what they're going to see or experience at the CTC, but they have to at least be able to see it, feel it, touch it, experience it, and get start to gain an understanding of it at home station before they move into the graduate level exercise at one of our combat training centers going forward. That's great. General Frost, anything to add on that? So one thing I didn't I didn't state up front, I think most everyone recognizes, is the, the 15 personnel and any of the personnel that we bring to a cyber pilot are personnel that already have a day job. Uh, this is not force structure that exists today. 
what we're trying to do is define what that force structure training that would be needed at all leadership levels to understand this domain, um, understand how we would maneuver through, through it, um, defend within it. So that is what we're really, the pilots are hoping to inform as we go forward. Um, and we recognize that in, a, in an army that, well, within DOD where emerging growth is a really uh, bad uh, phrase, but we do have to say, um, and I think this is where General Odierno said, we can't wait until 2025 to have this discussion. The cyber discussion, the EMS discussion, I think which is a more holistic look at it, has to happen now. And we need to define what the requirements are and then build uh, what is truly needed at a time and place when the Army can either decide to make some really tough decisions within force structure uh, or we look at some emerging growth options. Over. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is gonna be over to uh, Colonel Ken Rector from the Cyber School. Uh, Ken, how do you see the CSCB pilot informing cyber doctrine for the Army as we go forward? Uh, thanks, sir. Uh, I think it, it really lashes up on what uh, Colonel Oatman just mentioned because the observations we, we've, we've had when we go out and to uh, observe what's happening, happening is really a, there's really a void about training in cyber operations. So when Colonel Turner, uh, we knock on your door and say, hey, we're cyber and we're here to help, uh, you know, we come back and ask, you know, my peers, when's the last time or were they ever uh, educated on cyber operations? And the answer is normally no, unless they've had a unique experience in their in their uh, professional career. So what we do now in conjunction with uh, Army Cyber and the Cyber Operational Force and, and everything that uh, General Frost just uh, talked about, we have the Army Leader Cyber Operations Course. And, and that is a MTT, if you will. We go out to uh, the formation that's getting ready to deploy or go to a, a CTC rotations. And we have about a four day uh, immersion training, if you will, with the battle staff. And it's really about the senior leaders. And we try to expose them to, you know, Cyber is here, it's going to affect your operations, it's going to enable your operations. And we take the SMEs down here and try to uh, work through the battle staff of how they synchronize, incorporate, and consider cyber, cyber operations in their, in, their, in their planning. So I think from the institutional aspect of it, there is a void in our Army about exposing, uh, exposing the rest of the Army to cyber operations, unless they've had the fortunate opportunity to work in a, in a cyber environment. So I think that informs, and, and that's really on the institution to, to, to determine how we're going to get that out to the force. And it goes even much deeper, uh, as uh, General Frost alluded to, the SEMA cell. You know, when you talked about the SEMA cell, uh, there's a given, when you have that C as in cyber, uh, you know, that someone in the SEMA cell understands a little bit about cyber, has been exposed to cyber. But what we've done is taken the construct of the existing EW force inside those uh, maneuver formations and we said, okay, now guys, you're now the SEMA cell. So we owe it to those electronic warfare experts as well and professionals to expose them to the baseline cyber operations so they can actually be uh, the, the, the SME inside who can advise and give counsel to the brigade commander so he or she can make a decision about how to conduct operations. So I think uh, the, the operations, the events that's happened has, has identified that void inside of our institutional army that we need to address uh, in the near term. Thanks, Ken. So a number of questions are coming in from the audience that, that, that nest are within the next question uh, here, and that is this sort of alignment between electronic warfare and cyber. Uh, I think everyone views this as an area of significant tactical opportunities, and how do we see us integrating these capabilities at the tactical, uh, at the tactical edge? Steve, I'll t start with you and head over to Ken Rector next, and anybody else who wants to comment on that. Okay, sir. So a number of different people will see it a number of different ways, and, and I think you know everybody has their perspectives, and they, gain, they, they develop those from their own foxholes. Uh, whether you're a, a guy that grew up for in the artillery fires community uh, and learned about integrating uh, lethal effects uh, on the battlefield on behalf of a commander, or, or whether you come out of a, uh, a different uh, professional uh, community. Um, clearly, the intent is enable the commander to accomplish his mission, uh, which is fight and win on the battlefield. So in order to do that, we have to have a body of effort that can integrate uh, cyber effects, electronic warfare effects, which can be the same, but can also be very distinctly different uh, depending on the assets being employed and the effects uh, uh, being employed against a specific target. Um, 
and then also bringing in the other pieces like information operations uh, and then layering on top of that some of the exquisite techniques whether they're cyber or whether they're uh, they fall into the uh, uh, the SAP arena uh, now transcending all of those pieces requires a uh, an, an element that that understands all of it. They don't have to be the expert in the craft. Um, the expectation, like uh, like Ken said, is the SEMA cell understands the cyber. There's no expectation on that Steve Oatman has got to have the on-network hacking capability that they're going to expect of one of their 17 alpha cyberspace operators. But Steve Oatman or whoever else it is that's in that SEMA cell needs to understand the effects that are being employed, needs to understand the complexity of those effects, effects and how to deconflict those effects and integrate those effects uh, for a commander so that they can be employed on the battlefield, understanding also the second and third order impacts to the intel community, the signal community, whether that's because of collection uh, or whether that's because of frequency management, uh, or other things. And then at the same time, that SEMA soldier will also be the one that is integrating those resident or potentially uh, apportioned in uh, offensive electronic warfare effects uh, that are going after other target sets at the same time, uh, and then understand how to layer those different effects together to create an expanded uh, capability uh, on behalf of the commander so that then he can operate unimpeded uh, within the spectrum um, and also understand how to articulate that to a commander uh, in, in words that, that a commander understands and not in dolphin speak. Um. Ken, Ken, over to you. <laughs> so if I had to put you know, two sentences on what I think the aspiration of what the SEMA cell would be for the maneuver commander, it would be comprised of experts who are prepared to receive other experts. So they, they are part of the battle staff. Uh, they, they are part of the team. The commander has complete confidence in, in that team. But they also have the ability to do the groundwork, the coordination. So when the experts, whether it be OCO, DCO, or Doden, whatever comes to uh, expeditionary or as a plug-in to the formation, that when that team arrives, they are prepared to do operations. They don't have to spend a lot of time doing the groundwork or figuring out, you know, let me, can I see the unit? You know, can the unit see themselves? And, and back to your earlier question, I think we have a challenge right now and to uh, allow us to see ourselves. You know, what I look like to them, how can I graphically depict to the, the maneuver commander how the enemy sees me? Uh, and we, we talk uh, many times in, in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, many people say, well, you have to be the needle in the haystack. Well, I submit to you, you need to be the needle inside of a bunch of needles in the, in the sense that you can't be so unique that you just stand out there and they find you. You have to embed into the, the EMS environment that you do have unique characteristics, but it'll be very difficult to find you uh, inside of that totality of the, of the environment. So I, I believe Jerry probably has some observations from his experience, but we owe, owe that to the maneuver force that seem to be the experts who are prepared to see, receive other experts. Jerry, go ahead. If so, I, I didn't even know what a SEMA cell was when we started this, right? So we'll start with that. But, but I tell you, we, we did about 30 reps probably of, of, of the operations process in one way or another. Uh, and, and we got a great young officer from, from cyber there, uh, Captain Sally White, uh, who came and really led our SEMA cell uh, as we begin to figure this thing out. And, and it's really, it's actually more complicated than that, to be perfectly honest, because we automatically already want to create another stovepipe called SEMA, right? Uh, when really, it's also tied to protection. And then it's also tied to fires. And then I'm talking about what effect I'm trying to achieve. And then well, we were talking about it back there. A lot of it's because we're used to, as an army, the synchronization of mass. That's what we do. We mass our effects at a particular time and place. I would argue that some of this, there's a, there's a component of harmonization to it. How do I harmonize EW where I, where I jam in order to enter a network, in order to attack it with fires? None of that's massing anything. Um, there probably is a time and place to mass, and, and we did do that a couple of times. And I messed up quite a few of these operations, by the way, not just not just the one. But but I, I think as we look at I, I think as we look at the the the, the way we organize ourselves, uh, the the component of education was what was made us most successful, uh, because the battlefield's gotten so at least my talk has gotten so complex that the only person who can do all that is me. 
And if I'm not trained to understand every capability that exists within that spectrum, because uh, it is, there's so many experts that are running around in there that are very good at their specific niche, but don't necessarily see how that impacts one place or the other. Great conversation. And the good thing is we're using words that, that old scouts can understand. Turn, neutralize, protect. Uh, those words help us communicate an effect that we're trying to achieve. Much harder if we hadn't used those words. You know, but when the defensive cyber guy comes in and says, hey, sir, what's your protection priority for your network? All of it, right? I mean, you got to protect. Well, sir, can't, nope, you got to prioritize what you want to protect. Uh, the only person who do that is the commander, right? So some, some of this is a significant education piece, I think, by senior leaders. And I'm sorry, but the last point I talk about is we got to rethink the visibility of, of our formation. You know, we're worried about tents right now, our, our camo nets on my talk, right? That thing stands out like a beacon uh, in any of the electromagnetic spectrums that I'm going to operate it in. So we got to think about how we put that stuff in sanctuary, how we keep it out of contact from the enemy, both in direct, EW access. We just got to kind of reframe some of these problems uh, that we're having as it goes to, again, protecting my mission command networks and attacking the enemies. Okay, I think we've sort of framed the issue now. Let's you know, I've got a number of questions for Colonel Turner in terms of the integration of this uh, during train up and, uh, and, and at NTC. So, Jerry, can you start off by telling us how you integrated uh, these the cyber electromagnetic activities into your train up? You know, long before you arrived at NTC and how instrumental that was to what you did when you got to NTC. Sure. As soon as we found out we were going to do the pilot, uh, General Frost and her team reached out to us and, and you know, offered to immediately embed in, in our training program. So right up front, I got to meet Sally White and her team. And, and really, our training initially was focused on a brigade understanding of the capabilities and what, what cyber brings to the fight. Uh, and then we rapidly kind of got from the, the classroom stuff into practical exercises uh, as we went into CPXs, a large number of those uh, in, in the constructive environment. Uh, while simultaneously, though, we began to bring the teams out and do very live uh, lane training uh, because there's, there is a bit of an art at the tactical level of the, of the application of this equipment that my soldiers need to understand. Uh, and, and we had to work that out. You know, most, most of the problems you have in every bad day I've had in the Army is usually tied to an ad hoc organization or a command and control problem, right? I mean, that's just every bad day I've ever had goes to something like that. So we worked really hard to figure out how not to have ad hoc organizations or command and control problems associated with that. Go ahead, man. So I think what you bring up is a good point. When we've gone through this pilot evolution, we've had units that requested, can you just bring that capability to the CTC, to this rotation? And our bottom line has been that if we're not with you from D minus 180 up to your employment to the combat training center, you will not be that unit because of the education. We do not have it right now institutionally to the depth that we need it. We need to have that staff education, that leader education to, for the pilot to be successful. This is not something you're just going to show up and think you're going to be effective in a very short, condensed CTC rotation. So that was really critical. And uh, units that say, well, we really don't have the white space, we say, thank you very much. We'll, we'll work with Forcecom to find another unit because that has been really what's made us successful. And just, just to close on that, that, you know, one of the best things we were able to do was we eventually got to the point where we were fighting a fighting constructive uh, using both offensive and cyber capabilities while doing a JAT uh, using EW. Uh, followed up by growlers dropping bombs and seeing the jamming, the effect of the bombs and what that was doing on the network and the empowerment the staff got out of be it, being creative and harmonizing that kind of got buy-in from the brigade that, hey, if, if we try, uh, we might be able to achieve an advantage over the enemy here. And, and, and so that was helpful. So, Jerry, again, back to, back to you next. So this is going to be Jerry Turner's show for a little bit here, but that's great. No, that's great. No, I mean, it, it re you really bring some great perspectives. So a lot of people have said that cyber is one of those things that if you're a major or above, it's sort of a confusing thing to do. But if you're below a major, it's actually sort of second nature to you in terms of its integration just because of the generational differences. Did you experience that when you are at NTC or during this train-up? I, I did. I, I, think, I think, first of all, a lot of our junior officers downrange have experience with some of the things that we would do anyway, 
mean, not to go into any details, but they're not that abnormal, to be perfectly honest. We've, some of them have been uh, fairly normal. It's how you think about them, how you integrate them, how you do those kind of things. It's, it's much, much tougher. Um, I think there is a, a, a better comfort level uh, with, with our young folks to understand uh, the complexity of the environment in which we're operating in. You know, I, I, I use the example is, you know, there's probably quite a few people in this room that don't text. Uh, you're probably going to have a tough time uh, figuring out, you know, how a network's operating or how you stay connected to somebody else. And they actually live by networks, our young people, right? That, that's really unique for me. You know, we were talking about capability. You know, when I was a kid, you had one best friend. You got everything, good and bad, from your best friend. So it was a moderating influence on us, right? Our, our, our young soldiers now have networks of people. So they're connected to good people for good things and bad people for bad things, and there's no moderating influence uh, between them. So they think in a very networked kind of way because that's how they operate in their daily lives. And I, th I really think we've got to figure out how to take advantage of it. Anybody else want to comment on that from their experiences? Ken, maybe? Uh, just, just one experience I had actually last week. I had an opportunity to speak to future battalion and brigade commanders uh, in, a, in a forum and talk a little bit about cyber. What I was caught off guard is I had actually had one commander uh, you know, make the point that my job is to maneuver forces and close with and destroy the enemy. I, not, it's not my, stu not my job to worry about my network. And he actually said that to me, and I said, well, stop. We have a discussion here. And he actually said, well, that's our cyber's job. Our cyber is going to monitor my network. And I said, possible, maybe. Likely, no. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we had this uh, discussion about it. I said, well, number one, commander with the big C, you are ultimately responsible for everything in your formation and including your network. And you better have the six be able to demonstrate the network. You'll be able to, be able to see yourself in about how your network is designed and where you have vulnerabilities, and that's commander business. You can't say that the six has it, the SEMA has it, or push it all the way back inside uh, Fort Belvoir and say that our cyber has it. But I was a little taken that there's there a relative, in comparison to us, a relatively young officer who actually thought that he didn't have to worry about uh, his network because our cyber had overwatch. So it goes back into the technology. Now, if I had that discussion with field grade officers or, or senior mid-grade NCOs warrant officers, we'd probably have a completely different uh, conversation. But it was a little bit of concern. It goes back to the void about educating uh, the realm of possibility and the vulnerabilities inside of networks themselves. And, and we're having that discussion um, in many forums that those of us sitting on this side of the table, many of you a part of Army Cyber and Second Army, is the network is a war fighting platform. So we need to treat it as such. It is not a service. It's not an IT service. It is the war fighting platform in which all of our war fighting functions, there is synergy that comes back to that mission command network that allows you the ability to shape and execute your operations. So how they look at their network, their tactical network, regardless of echelon, it is a now a war fighting platform. If we treat it as such, you will actually go into your, um, different, uh, your different battle rhythm events looking at how are you viewing the readiness of your tactical network. And then what do you have to protect? So when you were given that question, you, it's not going to be able, you're not going to be able to protect all. What pieces of your network are the most important? What operating systems, what applications are most important to protect during that phase of the operation? Because the adversary does get a vote. And so you need to know what is most critical for you to be able to execute that operation. The, the way I generally try to articulate it to friends of mine is you can't execute the Army operating concept without a network to support it. And there's really not a great duplicative capacity, you know, other than that network. So if you don't have that, you really can't operate. So it's definitely commander's business. That is, I think, loud and clear. So, uh, so Jerry, back to you again. Some examples of some innovation development. I think there's some unique opportunities presented by the strikers being involved in the, uh, in the exercise. But some of, those, some of the innovation that, uh, that occurred when you're out there with your, uh, with your brigade. Yes, sir. Again, I think it goes back to your earlier question, sir, you know, in terms of, of how comfortable younger folks are in trying to, to figure this stuff out uh, creatively, uh, given the opportunity to do it. So uh, there were a number of examples. You know, our, our, our striker brigades, uh, you know, I'm an infantry brigade that achieves decisive operations by tactical or operational mobility, moving to decisive or complex terrain to close with and destroy the enemy. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's we operate in a, in, in a 
fast uh, tempo in order to achieve those effects, either, either through an approach march or through mission command systems that allow me to plan faster or do the rest of the things. And, and really interesting stuff that, you know, uh, not, not only just cyber folks, uh, as we're creating, as we're monitoring a network to see how we're achieving effects, you know, young people that understand what we're going to do saying, hey, sir, I think this means that. Because in our network, that's how we would chat or that's how we would talk. Look, the language is going to change. Uh, or how you modify equipment rapidly to, to put it on a striker so that you can achieve uh, some success. Or you could have easily put it on another uh, moving vehicle, uh, which we tried with a couple of different ways, payloads for, for both aircraft, UAS, et cetera. Um, so, so I think, sir, there, there quite a bit of innovation that, that if it had been living to, you know, left to me, could have never happened. Um, and I think we've got to rely on some of our youngsters for some of that. So I think uh, another success that we've achieved over the last two years is allowing the cyber warriors to work side by side with a brigade combat team. They're already thinking and having innovative ideas of how to help you visualize this domain. So if we kept them detached and not understanding what you're trying to see and what you're trying to affect, allowing the cyber soldiers sitting and working one at home station training and understanding how you operate and then going into the uh, combat training center, they were able to say, wow, with a little bit of ingenuity, I can build an antenna to do X, Y, and Z. It's not something that is a program of record, but with you know, some resources, we could make it happen. And we were given a lot of flexibility for the soldiers to bring those innovative ideas and actually uh, demonstrate uh, capabilities that aren't in the Army inventory. But if we didn't put those soldiers sitting side by side with the soldiers of your brigade, we would not have had that experience. And I think that is what continues. So they come out of the, they came out of the last CTC rotation, they're already thinking about how to make the next one better. What capabilities, what could they bring to the next rotation? Sir, if I may, and I, I think what General Frost alluded to is a wonderful characteristic of the cyber branch today. We have uh, NCOs, officers, warrant officers, who came from almost every branch in the Army. And they have from OCS as a Sergeant First Class to OCS, and now he is a, is a Second Lieutenant, uh, to uh, infantrymen who in the Ranger Regiment or infantrymen, quartermasters. We have everything. And, and I think when we allow them the space to think about problem sets, they bring that life experience and Army experience into that formation. They have the technical expertise now, but they also have the foundational expertise about uh, being a maneuver commander, being a field artillery officer, being whatever they came from. So I, I think we've seen that uh, play out in spades. There, there was a, a PFC uh, in Hawaii who they, they, give, they bought him a Raspberry Pi, and they said, hey, we need you to figure this thing out. And they give him about a week to come up with some EW kit and a soldier produced, a PFC, because he's wired that way. He grew up in that environment. He said, I have some, I have some, I have some technology in front of me. I wanted to do X, Y, and Z. I, cannot, I, need, I need you to go buy me one of these things from Radio Shack or whatever. And then, and then the private comes through and, and delivers a piece of kit, if you will, uh, because that's, just, that's the, uh, the younger uh, generation thinks that way. But, but I think, foundationally speaking, if you look at the, the, the makeup, the composition of the cyber core, we are emboldened by uh, where they come from and, and, and how they've arrived. That's great. Jerry? When you were out there at NTC and you were working this in a force-on-force -force environment, like what were some of the effects? Obviously, staying in a uh, in a you know not uh, not the TS or secret realm, but what what effects did you find most useful to you as a maneuver commander in terms of enabling your fight and supporting it? Yeah, uh, it's a, I, for me personally, it was actually uh, you know probably influence operations, whether that was uh, turning, neutralizing, uh, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, the connective tissue between, you know, the enemy main force and its, its, uh, its, its local forces that were there. Um, and and they, they were very, uh, very specific effects uh, at a very specific time and place. And, you know, one of the things you got to remember when you're doing it is when you turn it on and when you turn it off matters. Uh, and, and that was where a couple of places I made a mistake. I just left it on too long. And if I had been smart enough by turning it off, I could have opened up a different capability. So I think that there were, were certainly some of those. And then, and then the confluence of, of offensive and defensive was very, very important as we trained to it uh, because our defensive team uh, was of the quality that we knew when the enemy 
was going to was attempting to enter the network and so the natural response from the old scout is turn it off right <laughs> we don't want that turn it all off uh, and 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 again young people thinking through capabilities could say hey but there's an opportunity here depending on which part of our network or which part of our understanding of ourselves we expose that's pretty powerful right uh, that, uh, very very thoughtful um, but that was a combination again now of the SEMA cell with the protection cell kind of working through that process to get after it. Okay. Any other comments from the group? Um, so, Jerry, one question coming from the audience, and that is, you know, how do you as a commander decide to, you know, make the decision on whether you're going to fight with a degraded network or a full-blown full network as you're balancing your training priorities and your ability to execute that and sort of your maturation of your training model as you're going forward? I mean... It would be great to be able to get to such a level you could completely eliminate the network and try to work off semaphore, but that may not be, you know, possible based on where you are. So how did you how did you meter that so it was incorporated but not overwhelming? Yeah, and that's a fair question. It kind of goes back to an earlier comment of mine. I mean, I, I think if we have a, a decisive protection requirement, it has to be our mission command networks, right? Um, we can say we'll fight degraded, and we will, and we'll do pretty darn good at it because I've got eight, I've got great infantrymen, but we'll need more of them. Uh, I, I will lose the ability to have operational or tactical mobility. So, for example, you know, when I was at NTC, because my network was, what, I'm a CS-15, Inc. 2 equipped brigade, and we know how to use our stuff. Could you describe and, everybody what that means? Yeah, I'm sorry. So I'm, yeah, I'm, not sorry. Sure, I'm not sure sorry, I understand I, what I, that I, means. I, and I'm really not this big of a geek e anyway. You know, I don't know all these numbers, what they mean. Uh, but but I, I'm a CS-15, so I've got, I've, got, uh, um, I've got upper TI, lower TI. And, and I have the ability to communicate over, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tactical internet, sir, yeah, I can't explain. You, follow up, <laughs> if you would. Um, I have the ability to communicate anywhere in the world from my striker to any of my subordinates. So I'll give you an example of what we just did on Pacific Pathways. We did a call for fire mission from a, a battalion FSO in Indonesia through the brigade talk in Malaysia and fired the rounds at JBLM. Okay, so, so if, you, if you make that stuff work, uh, it's an, a powerful capability. The problem is, is if we go back to analog completely and I'm running FM retrans, I will outrun my retrans in one hour. That's how long I have comms, one hour. So when I cross LD to the next hour is all you can have me fight my striker brigade. So can we do it and do we practice it? Of course. But what all of these networks, if we get them all up, what they give us is options, right? So you, the enemy's good, he ain't that good. He can't attack everything I've got. The problem is we're relying specifically on one or two networks in any of the formations, and so the enemy can focus on where to attack that network. I need all those pipes because all those pipes give me the capability to have some adaptability and agility within my formation. So, but, but I, do think, I do think that if it was me, one of the Army's number one priorities would be to protect these networks. It's what makes us with the current force structure capable of doing what we're asked to do. Okay. Jerry, can I follow this up because yeah. it's a good point that General Fox makes. Before your rotation, before you started working, did you see the network as a warfighting platform? Yeah, I, I, I sort of, sir. I'm, you want to, yeah, I don't. The question was, did you see your network as a warfighting platform before you began the rotation? I, how, I, did you view it? how did you view it afterwards? Yes, sir. I, I think I did as I started to, but it was slowly, you know, so we've got a lot of experience in decentralized operations throughout the world over time. And, and almost always the limiting factor was my ability to communicate, right? One, to, to exchange information, to exchange intelligence, to exchange ideas. That was always one of our big problems. So as I took command, we were knee deep in, 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 in capability set 15 uh, draw, and we made it a leadership thing, just let's go figure it out. We said, hey, this might not work, but it won't not work because lack of willpower, right? We're gonna, we're gonna will some of this to, to see if it works. And as we started to train, sir, the things that we started to figure out that were gonna give us immense capability, primarily in tempo, right? If I can outthink, out communicate, then the speed of my strikers becomes absolutely vital. And so we, for example, did a blended exercise again with cyber component to it, where we had two battalions force on force in Yakima and two battalions CPX at JBLM, and I could talk to each of them equally. And they, I had all the same pipes, all the same comms, so I'm no longer tied fixed to my talk. 
right? I, I don't have to be anywhere near it. Um, and, and so that goes back to how we protect, you know, our mission command nodes. Why do we have them so far forward any dang way so that they can be attacked when they get, they're a Christmas tree, right? I mean, you could go to Radio Shack and see my talk from as far away as that thing can come from. So I don't want to give anybody ideas, but that's what I think. I don't know that. Um, so, sir, I, I think we learned over time that, that this network was, was going to be our advantage, uh, however we were going to do it. So I'm trying to integrate, uh, I'm trying to integrate uh, some questions from the audience here because I'd like to be known as the DCG of the people. Um, <laughs> so the question from the crowd comes in is, if networks are a warfighting platform, where do humans fit in? So that might be a Ken Rector question. I, I think they're at the top of the food chain. I mean, we talk about you know, the, the, human, the human capacity will, should outweigh technology every time because the networks will change, the networks will evolve. evolve. And we have to, you know, and, and the Army has uh, to date and is leading, I would, I would, think, I would suggest the DOD in, about, in investing in the human capital. Uh, we've invested in the soldier aspect of it. We're, we're on our way to invest in the, the Department of Army civilian aspect of it as well. But we can't, we, we, we clearly have to be mindful of our, our industry partners, you know, because, you know, whether, the, I, I think it's probably uh, unrealistic to think the DOD, the Army, is going to uh, dominate and be the leader in this technology. It's going to be a partnership between the DOD, the industry, academia, and such, and we'll get there together. Uh, but to say that the Army is going to, you know, lead the network, evolution of the network. And, and I think the last discussion, the point Jerry made, merits some discussion. Because is it, is it our challenge or requirement to, uh, as some people use the word, dominate the domain? Do we dominate the domain at all times to all people? Or is it more like a seed mission from old school, uh, you know, back in the fall to gap? That we have the ability, if required, for a finite time at a finite location, in a fire, you know, with parameters, to dominate that environment uh, as required. But in the congested environment, do we, do we have to maintain situational understanding of the environment at all times, but be able to, quote, dominate it uh, when required to support uh, combat operations or whatever operation you're doing? Because I, I would submit to you, if we were to say, hey, we're going to dominate the domain, all domains at all times, that's a very expensive proposition in people, capacity, equipment, technology, and structure. Because if you need a lot of infantrymen, you also need a lot of other people to, to uh, manage that domain, especially at the, at the uh, capacity and the depth and the and breadth of your operating your unique uh, organization. Yeah, yeah, Ken. I mean, I would just, I would just. I mean, what, I, what I've certainly learned is that it's, 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 it's a, you know, it's crazy to think that you're going to dominate the cyber domain any more than you're going to dominate the land domain right. or the air domain. I mean, we don't control everything that flies in the globe, but you can, you can selectively, as a commander, choose a portion of that domain you want to have superiority on for a period of time, and then you've got a great chance of being able to yeah, do I that. I absolutely thing. embrace assured comms. We need to have assured comms for mission command to make sure the commander can be a commander. Uh, but but there might be some blips in it, you know, at, at certain times. But it, given that given the specificity of a mission, then we have to be all in to make sure that commander, whatever operation is, is successful based off they have their operation uh, the mission command platform. Uh, but but the entire spectrum in you know information dominance is it information dominance or is it information warfare? I mean we we could have that philosophical discussion as well. But I, I think uh, when we people throw out you know, others throw out dominance at all times, I don't we got to be I think we'd be measured about what that really means to people. So to follow up on that question, so yes, network warfighting platform, but it's to um, transmit and receive data. So we can have the discussion, are we in an information age or a data age? I'd turn it over to, to Colonel Turner and say you were probably overwhelmed with data, but to get to what information is important to actually get to the knowledge you need to make a decision as a commander, that is where we're struggling. So. You know, it, that's for the human capital. What of the data is important to you that is actually the information you need to get you to make the decision? That is really complex in an, in an environment where you're just overwhelmed. The, the, the volume of data and how that is going to continue to grow exponentially every year and what's going to impact you on the ground. So, I, I mean, how did you feel with the amount of data you received? I don't know that you... Yeah, no, no ma'am. Yeah, by far and away, the, the toughest thing I had to do was fuse everything, right? The, 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 by far and away. The, you have so many, and, and it's not, you know, we typically look at our hierarchical structures from 20 years ago and think, you know, all this data goes through the two shop, is fused in the two shop, and then somehow miraculously comes out to you as a product. Uh, that just can't happen anymore. Um, there are too many. There are too many pipes 
that aren't connected that provide information. Uh, if a, a, an OCO team, not anything to do with the two, and in fact its report may not go into the two shop, is providing somebody information, confirming or denying by being in a network or not being in a network or responding to the visualization of the network. So, so how do we create a, the structure around a commander to be able to help him see all those things. And, and I'm with you, Ken. I, I in no way mean to say that the network is, we're dominating it or it's all important, but I don't look at the network as a point to point connection, right? I look at the network as a very diverse uh, across all spectrums that give me options so that when I don't dominate it, because I'm gonna lose part of it, right? That's, that's how I train. I'm going to lose satellites or I'm gonna lose my line of sight or I'm gonna lose FM. But, but Fernando and me to do all five or six of those multi-spectrum operations, he's, I'm in a lot of trouble, right? That's, that's what I'm trying to say. If, but if all of my networks are up, I can pick which one I'm operating on for that very specific time. But, but it truly is about the people. Uh, I, and I'm, I'm, I am not a machine guy at all. Um, but, but I do think we've got to figure out how, how, we, how we fuse all this um, because it's, it's a lot. And, and I, don't, I don't think it's any easier for division and cores, by the way. Right? I, I've got a pretty robust staff uh, that are pretty good at what they do. And in many cases, the higher you go, your experiential level isn't that much greater. It's just not. It's, it's kind of the same guys doing stuff at a different level, same guys and girls doing stuff at a different level. And so I, I think at all cases, how we, how we wrap the, command, the commander around some ability to, to synthesize this information is what's important. I'll just provide the perspective when we're talking about, about humans. I mean, so it is about humans. You know, I sort of thought coming in the technology would be exquisite, and it is to some degree, but really it is the humans that make the difference. And then underpinning and really motivating all of that is is good, strong Army leadership. And time and time again, what is really holding these teams together, making them effective, and really making the, making the difference is good, strong Army leadership that looks a lot like leadership in the 101st Airborne Division or in the Ranger Regiment. That's exactly what's happening within our cyber units right now as they're conducting operations. So the human piece of it is, is absolutely vital, going back to the, uh, to the original question about the network. So we spent a lot of time talking about uh, NTC and the, the, the training. So let's talk a little bit about how in the last you know, 13, 14 minutes we have, uh, how that informs the future for us. And I'll try to incorporate some of the questions from the crew as well. Um, but first to General Frost, how do you think the CSCB pilot's gonna influence future decisions on the Army in terms of structure capabilities as we, uh, as we move out of the pilot phase of this in about six, seven months, and then start transitioning into uh, implementation of some changes. So I think we already demonstrated that the Army can be agile. We've made changes in MTO structure already, recognizing that we needed cyber defenders at Echelon. So that was a quick decision made. We moved out. We made it happen. What type, and I do believe, what type of expeditionary SEMA force do we need in, in the force of the future? We already recognized we need to develop knowledgeable cyber planners and I really, and, and I say cyber, I, I, I should just say SEMA. I mean, understanding, I really go to, let's get to understanding electromagnetic spectrum. How do we look at that electromagnetic environment? What do you need to incorporate to really look at all of your weapon systems and your platforms and how do they have to work within um, the, we can say EME. I know we're, we're all going through different services of what we're gonna call it in the future. Um, and then there are things that we have to recognize at what do we want to achieve and what type of operating environment do we want to have exist at the combat training centers. So there has to be an investment made. Um, do we have a more robust uh, cyberspace domain infrastructure that needs to exist? Do we have to look at uh, how do we want to replicate that contested um, electromagnetic environment? Um, you can talk about it at the CTCs, but we really got to look at home station training, which is really uh, on Colonel Oatman's plate, of how do we start at home station training? What kind of tools can we give to the installations that units can go and draw certain type of, of kit that they can take to either a company, um, battalion, brigade type exercise to help emulate this contested environment and start to have really those those uh, exercises to look at um, how they're gonna train and fight. So I think those are things we're already, we're teeing up right now. We're actually looking at a pilot in February that we're gonna do out in Colorado with the Colorado Army National Guard to look at some type of um, kit that we could bring to the installations to do that 
um, contested environment, so an, an electronic warfare uh, demonstration. And then the Army would know what to purchase in the future. So we're looking at, I mean, I'm putting it out for the industry partners, this is a huge challenge. How do we do this knowing that you have to have really directed type, direct injection jammer type capability because you can't just do this. If you look at where our installations sit, you're not gonna just jam because <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna get angry a lot of civilian um, the civilian populace. So we have to have to look at the technology of how can we emulate this at home station training to give our soldiers um, the right environment in which they can figure out how to maneuver, degraded or denied. Steve, you got some comments? Yes, sir. So I'll just elaborate a little bit. I think on you know the theme that General Frost was already hitting, and realistically, the CSCB is really gonna inform us across the dot mil PF. I believe it's going to give us emerging doctrine requirements that we haven't already looked at. Uh, it's going to give us or help us refine and shape that organizational structure of the future for the ECT or for a, a organic or echelon, maybe above brigade, but an echelon within the core of EW capabilities uh, that are uh, available for a commander, a division commander, or a corps commander to apportion out to his main effort brigade uh, that allow a commander to then create space in the electromagnetic environment. Um, it'll help us to define where the, where's the delineation of those different types of effects are. The, the exquisite cyber effects and, and the more non-exquisite, uh, although not barrage, I'm not saying barrage jamming by any stretch of the imagination because that's, that is, Gone by the wayside, we don't need to do that. There are other ways to get after counter C2 um, with EW systems and counter RF capabilities with, uh, with sophisticated techniques, but that aren't barrage jamming, and we can do that. Um, where are the uh, areas that we really have to look at authorities and policy adjustments so that we can bring those capabilities to the tactical edge? Um, and, and understanding uh, and allowing a commander to understand how long sometimes it takes to get some of those authorities approved to get them down there for him to, pr to uh, employ, um, and then uh, allowing that commander to understand that uh, hopefully it's not a one-time capability employment that we, we you know, turn loose and burn, the, the, or that's a significant decision that has to be made that probably gets withheld at a higher, higher level as we go forward. Um, and then it also, really to identify those gaps between our, our critical collaborative teams, Intel, Ops 3, uh, Six Signal, uh, Fires community, uh, Information Ops, MISO, MILDEC type community, uh, and identify where those gaps are and how do we bring all of that together uh, to support the commander. So that the, the CSCB is aimed at all of that in reality uh, as we move forward, as, as the, the phases transition from, from the initial phases that, uh, through the next several years as, as we uh, continue to execute. Um, and then I'll touch on the home station training piece. General Frost, is, you know, she, she hit it and she, she said, you know, how do we do it uh, in a spectrum constrained environment? Uh, we can't require our home station units to have to go through a six-month spectrum clearance process to be able to use a somewhat benign or, or limited live EA or, or cyber effect capability to train their formations at home station. So how do we get after that? Even if it's not full spectrum, we allow our formations to touch different aspects, whether that's precision precision navigation and timing, uh, counter comms, uh, uh, upper or lower TI, uh, degraded or denied environments uh, that they may or may not have to operate in to then execute some type of degraded uh, fight because, as Colonel Turner alluded to, he expects that he's going to have to fight degraded at some point in time on the battlefield. Um, so how does he train to that? Um, and then as his uh, his... Uh, ability to reconnect emerges, how does he then reconstitute and quickly seize the initiative again once he has the full SA that he can have? Um, and then I think the last piece I'll tie into that is, is back to the visualization piece that we've talked about all along. And again, it's the collaborative piece where Colonel Turner said, the adversary is not 10 feet tall. 
He's not going to bring everything to bear and shut me down across the board the majority of the time. That's a significant effort to be able to do that. But the commander needs to understand where, are, where is he vulnerable based on the adversary's capabilities and how they're arrayed on the battlefield so that he knows when and where he may lose SATCOM, but he may know he may have FM comms. Or where does he know that he's going to lose FM and he's going to have to rely on some other means of communication so that he can establish a true and valid pace plan that allows him to transition from each phase of the battle. But understanding that means that we have to be able to see the electromagnetic environment in real time and be able to then digest that and portray it to the commander so he can make decisions um, as he moves on the battlefield uh, in real time or in, re in near real time. Uh, and right now, we are constrained somewhat in being able to see that real EME uh, in a, uh, a current uh, picture, both in the, the ability to, vis to portray it visually, but even in the sense of getting those sensed emissions back to a point where we can then collate them and portray them going forward. Okay, we have now entered the speed round phase of questioning. So the, moder the panel members have one minute to answer each of the questions. And again, a tremendous number of questions come from the audience that I'd like to work at. So first off to Ken Rector. Um, how is the CSCB pilot informing the way the cyber school is creating new, uh, new cyber soldiers? One minute, okay. So I think it's a given now inside our cyber school, we talk about the, the continuum, the cyber continuum, whether it be fiber on the left side and, and electron, you know, the spectrum on the right, they're inextricably linked. And you're going to have to go through that. And as a cyber operator, you have to understand the cyber aspect of it. And you have to understand the electronic war warfare aspect, aspect of it, even though you may not be, be doing it, because that'll be informed in so much that we are taking Bolick graduates and we're sending them to the electronic warfare school at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Now, we're going we're gonna to assess if, if they are you know, exponentially better officers when they come out the other side and they go to their first cyber operations, cyber mission force uh, you know, job, or how we inform that about the education aspect of it. But I, I, I think uh, you know, understanding that the, the cyber is, is the far left uh, fiber, far right uh, you know, the spectrum, and we have to inform to make sure cyber operators can work in that domain on both sides of it and be value added to whoever they are supporting. Hey, Ken, there's another, there's another question from the audience in the cyber school, and they just want to quickly hear about how you're using adjunct professors. Really, the question is, have you considered I know you're doing it. Could you just give them a brief description of how you're using adjunct professor, professors to, in your courses? Yeah. Absolutely. So we have, more, more likely, the SME about a certain piece of equipment or technology is in the cyber mission force, uh, you know, working, uh, defending the nation today. So if we have a class that has to do with a certain type of equipment or a certain kind of technology, the thought is we would bring those those adjunct professors off of the Cyber Mission Force team, bring them in as a, a guest lecturer, if you will, about teaching the class so that the students will get the most recent operational experience about how the, what they're seeing in the environment and they can portray that to the students inside the class. Now, given that the majority, not all, but the majority of our uh, program of instruction is at the TSSCI level, so we can have those instructors come out of the the Cyber Mission Force, whether it be at Fort Gordon, Georgia proper, or other agencies inside of the, the uh, cyber enterprise and come down to that. So absolutely. So I think that's important to keep the, the lecture relevant and fresh because we have the people who are on the front line of cyber today coming in to be in, uh, adjuncts, professors, if you will. Okay. Uh, got a question from the audience. It says, traditionally, the op for the experience, repetition, innovation have developed better capabilities than our potential adversaries. What are we doing to collect op for techniques and innovations in cyber and EW, and what are we doing with it? Steve, maybe I'll go to you. So we, we are uh, looking at and, and understanding what the op for the adversary has in terms of its capability, uh, and the intent is to look at peer, near-peer adversary capabilities that are out there across the globe uh, and, and focus on allowing the op for to integrate those capabilities into the battle space uh, within the constraints that that threat system has in terms of propagation, power, uh, agility, uh, frequencies that it can target, those types of things, so that it is truly 
uh, replicative of the threat system. Uh, we also are only, uh, or the intent is that if the OP4 is employing the system, it has to be detectable and identifi identifiable on the battlefield. So therefore, it has to be targetable by the rotational unit if they can find it and take it out of play at the same time. It, the, the, er, there is no intent to have something that the RTU uh, can't do anything about, um, just so we can apply additional uh, headache onto the, the rotational unit uh, and force them to fight in, in, in a, uh, a constrained manner uh, as we go forward. Uh, so we're looking at that across multiple uh, uh, venues or, or options, both uh, commercial and GOTS. Quick reaction capabilities have been already been developed and some new uh, emerging uh, rapid equipping uh, capabilities that are being looked at as we go forward. And then also looking at uh, an actual org restructure to the OP4, both at uh, the Geronimo's at JRTC and the Black Horse out at NTC to give them an EW uh, detachment or platoon type of formation organic to the OP4 that they command and control and employ on the battlefield like any other part of their, their maneuver formation as they go forward. That's great. Okay, so the final question goes to Colonel Jerry Turner. Um, I think we've talked around this and I think everyone's pretty clear. And, but uh, just uh, some final thoughts on how important it is as a maneuver commander for you to be able to integrate cyber at the tactical edge. Yeah, I, I mean, I think everything we've seen in, in the current operations of you know, other countries shows that in, in some ways our adversary has an advantage just because of the speed of decision making associated with it. Uh, you, you know, my, 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 my worry will always be, and, and uh, General Frost probably don't want me to say this, but I, I know I told General Carrion this, that, that I, I truly believe it's a capability that we need at the tactical level, that we want it at the tactical level, but I'm not sure the Army in its hierarchical nature will give it to us. And I think that's what we really got to work through is how we get to those points where we're flexible. I, uh, flexibility is a bad word. Where we're agile and adaptable enough on the battlefield and still protect uh, the institution and the Army from doing something too extreme. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause for this great panel.